Um, it is almost two o'clock. We'll just settle down and we'll wait for others to join, if that may be the case. But we're we'll oh, that's two o'clock. I mean, we're gonna get the show on the road then. <laughs> um, welcome, welcome, students, staff, faculty, and members of the Stanislaus community. Uh, my name is Isaac. I am one of two interns from the Male Success Initiative here at Stan State. Uh, for those in the audience new to our virtual discussions at Stan State, here at Stan State, we acknowledge that Stanislaus resides on Yokit land. I will go ahead and pass the torch to the head honcho in charge, Carolina, aka Caro. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here, and thank you, Isaac, for the introduction. Uh, today's discussion is Housing Justice Now, and we're so excited to welcome, um, welcome all of you to um, join us in listening and educating ourselves and into some of the housing justice and, or injustice issues that are happening in our communities. And so today we have some invited guests in which uh, we'll introduce in just a minute. Um, thank you also, uh, Isaac, for helping uh, acknowledge and recognize that our campus does sit on Yoka territory, Yoka lands. And we always like to start our events that way, just so we can create uh, awareness about the importance of these traditional lands that we sit on. Uh, there are a lot of families still in our in our counties and our surrounding region who exist and still like to protect and still like to ensure that they are caring for the lands that we sit on. Uh, we also wanna take a moment to recognize that it is Diversity Awareness Month. And so uh, we celebrate all of our backgrounds, all of our identities, all of our cultures. And uh, we, th we do that throughout the year, but we like to acknowledge the fact that we're celebrating it this month as well. Uh, those of you who are new to the Warrior Cross Cultural Center, we are a home that uh, promotes diversity, inclusion, and social justice. We are a home to undocumented student services offices, and we're also home to the Male Success Initiative, which uh, really promotes and tries to encourage um, students, particularly males of color, uh, to uh, graduate within a faster rate and address the gender equity gap that exists um, throughout many uh, systems in higher education. Um, so we're here today again to welcome all of you. And we have a wonderful panel that will be, um, um, I'll be asking them to introduce themselves in just a minute to you. So, um, you know, I just want, want to again, thank you for, for joining us this afternoon. So back to Isaac. How y'all doing? <laughs> um, I would like to uh, go ahead and just start just introducing up the guest speakers. Uh, I would like to introduce two representatives speaking on the behalf of Faith in the Valley, who what I would also like to call friends, Anthony Araza and um, Latricia Beasley Day. Um, they're great people. Um, there are some cool people that do some dope work and I can't wait for you to listen to what they have to share for you guys. I would also like to introduce Dr. Jose Diaz Agata, who received his doctorates at Kent State University uh, in geography. His work is centered around urban geography and, and, and equity gaps, excuse me, in housing and will educate um, and familiarize everyone who knows uh, about California's housing crisis. Um, I would also like to introduce Dr. Dean, uh, say, I'm, I'm hoping I'm saying it right, Caviano. <laughs> Um, who received his education at York University in Toronto, uh, Canada, Politi um, in political science with an emphasis in political theory, and looks forward to politically engaging in the discussion of systems of domination. And that is it for our introductions. I don't know if I missed anything. Um, if Go ahead. Uh, you know, we're going to get this show on the road. <laughs> um, pass it to our first speaker. So at this point, we'll introduce Anthony, who is from uh, Faith in the Valley, a community organization, and he'll lead us in the presentation. Um, and we will definitely have room for um, this, this to be interactive. So we'll, you know, feel free to ask questions in the chat as we're listening to the information. So thank you. And Anthony, you have screen um, access. Definitely, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining today. Um, just want to start off by saying um, it's a pleasure to be in this space with everybody here and um, I can get started on the presentation. But first, I'd like to um, give the floor to sort of my um, partner organizer to introduce who Faith in the Valley is. 
our values and kind of what we do. Um, so I'll start sharing my screen with that presentation. Um, I hope everybody can see that. And I think within that, I'd like to introduce um, Pastor Day. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to see all of you. Welcome, welcome. Hope you came with your good listening ears and leaning in uh, to learn a little bit. Um, I am with Faith in the Valley. We are a grassroots organization. Um, Anthony, if you're sharing your screen, honey, we can't see it. Oh, you can't we, see are, it? No. we are a grassroots uh -oh. organization that spans um, five counties through the Central Valley. Uh, we are in San Joaquin, Stanislaw, Merced, um, Fresno, and Kern County. So we have organizers in each region that are on the ground fighting the good fight of faith. And we are so blessed and honored to be able to work in faith um, institutions. <clears throat> and we work with all people of diverse faiths. It is wonderful. It is fabulous because faith is what is our leaning foundation. And um, most people have some measure of faith and faith is what leads us and grounds us. So we enjoy, um, organizing in faith institutions, but we also organize outside of um, faith spaces. And we come together um, to fight what uh, is needed against uh, systemic racism, policies, uh, and housing, housing justice, because we truly believe that housing is a human right and everyone should have housing and have adequate housing. We believe in um, uh, the future is brighter if we fight together. And um, my personal uh, mantra is iron always sharpens iron. So we learn from everyone. Um, and we also do uh, immigration work. We help our uh, immigrant brothers and sisters um, for their justice as well. <clears throat> And we engage in this wonderful work of housing, like I said, because housing is a basic human right. And um, you'll hear more about that from um, Anthony as he presents um, uh, the work that we are currently in and will be doing. Anthony, take it away. Thank you so much. Solid introduction. Could always count on you. That's my rock right there. <laughs> Thank you, Latricia. Bless your so heart. As, uh, you know, as we sort of engage in this workshop together, like we said earlier, we kind of want to emphasize this uh, sort of space of, you know, common learning. So yeah, like we said, please use the chat to ask any questions or provide feedback um, as the event goes. We want to make it as engaging as possible. And also, you know, those questions and or feedback can sort of be addressed in the Q&A. So without further ado, um, presentation will be a sort of brief study on political and sort of economic history of our United States government's role in colonial violence, redlining, segregation, racially restrictive covenants, and sort of state violence brought upon oppressed people to maintain those conditions. And we'll get into all those sort of, you know, definitions as we go. Um, we sort of aim to show how these legacies impact oppressed people and how those conditions impact them today. So it'll follow this line of beginning with the expansion of empire to 20th century housing policies and connections to our current housing conditions. And there might be questions of wondering how these are related. And, you know, we hope to sort of communicate that as we sort of go. So sort of beginning with that, we want to really point to like the United States found, founding sentiment as well as the, this idea of expansion of empire. So within this, you know, this is by no means a detailed analysis of this sort of history because that could be an entire course or an entire you know, hours long discussion around these sort of issues. But we really wanna emphasize the treatment of you know, specific oppressed peoples um, and notably black and indigenous peoples during these periods of time and how that sort of connects to the overall attitudes um, in the realms of things such as housing or just overall treatment um, against certain peoples. So um, we, we sort of like see this, um, this founding and we in it like I say here genocide and exploitation and what does that mean you know this sort of founding um came at the expense of oppressed populations who you know have historically built and maintained the society 
uh, for, the, for the predominantly right ruling class. Um, and we can see that in things such as, you know, Adam Smith, this is one of like the founding figures, you know, he mentions the acquisition of valuable property is the way to create government. And at that time, you know, the acquisition of property was through African slaves and the use of cheap and free labor and the eventual extermination of the um, indigenous population. And even furthermore on that, um, President Andrew Jackson's removal acts, you know, this is a prominent figure in our United States history. This is a person who's on our money. This individual believed in the total extermination of the indigenous population and the removal of people who uh, were oppressed, including black folk. And even more um, prominent example that we always learn about as somebody who was a emancipator or someone who provided freedom to folk was President Lincoln. And you know, how many folk in this chat know about President Lincoln? You know, we hear about this person being the individual who freed the slaves, quote that. Um, however, throughout Lincoln's sort of presidency, he had this idea and endorsement of the thing known as the American Colonization Society. And this was essentially an effort and a sentiment which a, you know, there was a lot of sentiment to deport African slaves and people from the country after the emancipation. So there's this sort of like um, legacy here that we're trying to get at, that there is this like lack of treatment and lack of care for oppressed people who actually built the country themselves. And within all of that, we wanna really drive the point home that, you know, within this legacy, this bleeds into like later generations of, you know, presidents and or, you know, leaders within our government, which, you know, um, craft ideas as well as policies around, you know, um, the care for people, whether it be in housing or other um, land use policies. So within that, you know, we point to a prominent example once again, um, who in this chat knows who Franklin Delano Roosevelt is? I mean, this was somebody that I learned about pretty frequently and he was sort of seen as a sort of progressive individual. And he was uh, this person who saved the country from total ruin during the Great Depression. However, that's not you know the full story. And I think one thing Faith in the Valley Stanislaus is trying to do within this is really tell the truth about these histories and really get into like what that means. So. You know, FDR himself, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was very sympathetic to sort of the white working class. And, you know, they were having their grievances at the time and, you know, were experiencing their economic troubles. Um, but just like the individuals just mentioned, you know, whether it be Lincoln, Jackson or Adam Smith, um, there was this lack of care and concern, you know, on FDR's part. And just to point to some specific examples, you know, there was Jim Crow terrorism in the South, which caused a lot of black individuals to flee and come to places like the Central Valley. Um, there was a approval of, you know, mass deportation campaigns of Mexican farm workers here in California. Um, that was all under FDR's uh, administration. And even his like vehement and racist uh, internment uh, campaign against Japanese Americans or even people who were of Japanese descent. So, you know, really speaking to this and really emphasizing how legacy shapes um, policy, we can begin to talk about things such as, you know, um, FDR's federal housing program and, you know, making the connection from treatment of oppressed groups to the treatment within policy. So Homeowners Loan Corporation of 1933 and 1934 were federal housing programs designed by the FDR administration specifically um, to subsidize home ownership due to the fallout of the 90, 1929 depression. This guaranteed loans and subsidies, but it came at a, um, it came at a cost and with provisions you know, you had to be in a neighborhood that did not sell to anyone outside of the Caucasian race. So this created a very like exclusionary and um, it sort of created this dynamic of cutting off access to specific demographics within the United States. So just as, you know, we see the colonial violence of the, the previous people mentioned, we see also this sort of state violence being brought upon people, whether that be the lack of care in addressing the racial terrorism or like the deportation campaigns, we see FDR sort of perspective when it came to who was being catered to when it came to the housing subsidies. So, you know, we see this picture, it says here, we want white tenants in our white community. This was something that was very prominent during the FDR administration. These were um, constructs as well as, you know, sentiments of the white working class, as well as the um, presidential administration of the time. And within that, you know, um, the Federal Housing Administration and Homeowners Loan Corporation led to things such as, you know, redlining. This is just one of many housing practices of the 20th century. And redlining essentially um, drew out areas of cities, 
created essentially residential security maps um, deemed undesirable by the federal government to receive loan or aids. And not even just that, not even just in regards to like resources and aid, we also see this practice of um, locking out people from just settling or living in certain areas. And I mentioned here, I drew an arrow to this, this place in Stanislaus County specifically, and this was something that came up during, you know, the early 20th century Monterey Park Tract. And um, Monterey Park Tract is a part of many um, unincorporated areas of the Central Valley, which have a legacy of when that violence was occurring to, for example, black farm workers in the South, and they came to the Central Valley. These were the areas of the Central Valley where they were only allowed to live. And you can see here, there's a map of Modesto where the redlining was very prominent. And this was a map created by uh, two community partners who have done work around redlining and segregation and you know, have researched into that. We see the formation of Monterey Park Track due to the idea of people not being allowed to live in places like Modesto and even Turlock. So, and even further on that, um, the legacy of South and West Modesto. You know, I don't know if there's anybody in this sort of chat or who are attendees here who know anybody from South and West Modesto, but these are areas historically which have been withheld sort of government intervention, whether that be affordable housing or even just basic infrastructure. And just to move on to like that, we wanna kind of go into, you know, the specifics and how that relates to us regionally. So what's like the connections to like our current housing crisis? You know, this history of like colonial violence, the 20th century housing policies, as well as the um, lack of investment in, you know, communities of color. That's like the main driving point that we wanna see um be talked about um suburban subsidy as we mentioned earlier um this like enrichment and sort of investment in white neighborhoods led to an explosion of what we know today as the suburbs and it led to things such as the lack of investment in communities of color as mentioned and it led to many areas of our central valley um to decay as well as for large inequalities to um continue and even exist today um wealth accumulation is a large model of our economic system as well as the economic system which started our country so you know within that and you if you exclude certain demographics and you and you make it inclusive for only certain ones like mentioned in fdr or you know the founding sort of our, of our country when it came to the white working class you see um conditions where communities of color grow up without sort of any intervention or even la um, um, consideration of care and I took a quote from a housing inequity um, assessment report of you know, our Central Valley, and it specifically speaks to uh, places um, in our Stanislaus County. And it quotes, you know, the Central Valley um, sort of grew up without government intervention or urban planning. And as a result, often lacked basic, basic infrastructure like housing, wastewater systems, public water systems, streetlights, and crosswalks. So some of these sort of communities were located in more isolated areas, but you met, it mentions here, and this is very close to where I am, um, Modesto's airport neighborhood were on the urban fringes. So these were neighborhoods which, is, which historically were not afforded that access to those resources as well as that infrastructure. And we see sort of the impacts on that today, um, let alone COVID-19 has brought a lot of these sort of housing conditions to light for many folks. Whether you are close to the pain or you see it in your city, we know that COVID-19 has impacted the housing realm. And, you know, even just beyond COVID-19, we know that the, the access to affordable housing and to, um, to the care um, for communities of color has been absent for a very long time. Even just here, a statistic locally for Stanislaus County, 86% of extremely low-income households in Stan County are paying more than half of their income on housing costs, which is, has progressively gotten worse as, you know, the trends have gone on over the past few years. And even just to point further to it, the affordable housing supply here in the San Joaquin Valley or the Central Valley has actually seen a 66% decrease in the state and federal funding between fiscal, uh, a fiscal uh, budget year of 2007, 2008, and the fiscal budget year of 2007, 2018. And just to see on this graph, you can see here on the bottom right, um, Stanis for Stanislaus County, um, the percentage of extremely low income households that are um, cost burden is 90 percent so that's something that is very just like you know it's very indicting to hear and to sort of see that condition which exists for you know various people in our county and you know not even just that 
you know, I, I want to speak on that idea and like the issue of people experiencing homelessness. This has been a condition for, you know, generations. But, you know, as we see these sort of contradictions within this economic system we live in, we see the increase in people experiencing homelessness. We see the increase of evictions, the decreased affordable housing, all of these sort of contradictions of a supposed economic system that is repeatedly described as the best. Um, and sort of, you know, with all of that information and all of that in mind, um, there may be sort of wonder, you know, um, what can be done about, you know, this sort of predicament that we're in and these situations that a lot of people find themselves in. Um, and Faith in the Valley Stanislaus sort of has this idea around um, essentially organization. Um, we have a vision, as Pastor Day mentioned earlier, that housing is a human right. And I mean, that's a very bold statement to make, but you know, I think that there is a lot sort of wrong with this sort of housing situation that we have. And I think that our path forward is to push a vision that shows, you know, we believe in housing justice and we believe in freedom from corrupt housing practices, whether that be, you know, we mentioned state sanctioned violence or, you know, um, eviction, or even something as sweeping up in a, a, a an encampment of people experiencing homelessness. Um, you know, we sort of wanna speak against power and sort of organize with community members around this sort of idea of housing justice. And you know what that has sort of looked like for me and my partner organizer, and even with the Warrior Cross Cultural Center, is you know getting involved in developing relationships and solidarity with community members who are closest to these issues. Because oftentimes those are the people who aren't you know consulted with or even spoken to when it comes to forming sort of these visions around what housing justice can mean or even this idea of freedom from um, corrupt housing practices. So, you know, that's essentially our sort of vision for Faith in the Valley Stanislaus, myself as a housing organizer and Pastor Day as another housing organizer. And you can see here at the bottom right, um, we actually wanna provide an opportunity for attendees a part of this sort of workshop um, to come in and join us in community in a listening session next Thursday, April 22nd, from sort of 6.30 to 7.30, and bring your sort of perspectives, bring that those sort of uh, testimonies, and sort of talk about, you know, what it is, what organizing means to you, and what that can be, how that can contribute to sort of this idea of, you know, housing justice, and, you know, like we said, the freedom from the um, corrupt housing practices. So that's the crux of what I have and what you know i'd like to communicate to you all and sort of just like bringing home the idea of showing the historical um attitudes towards you know communities of color specifically black and indigenous folks and really tying the connection to like the current housing sort of practices you know and i want to end with sort of a quote and it's one of my favorite quotes because i think that you know when we think about all of these sort of conditions it becomes so interesting how normalized and you know how disconnected we can feel about you know um, things that are painful to a lot of people in our community and it's one of my favorites it's from um kwame Ture. he's an or he was an organizer with a student nonviolent coordinating committee it says it is not violent for a child is it, is it not violent for a child to go to bed hungry in the richest country in the world i think that is violent but that type of violence is so institutionalized that it becomes a part of our way of life. Not only do we accept poverty, we even find it normal. So with that, you know, I wanna thank everybody here um, for listening in on this part. And, you know, as we transition to the next sort of panelists, I really want, you know, folks to sort of think about what it means to normalize poverty or to normalize, you know, people experiencing homelessness or even to normalize ideas such as like this affordable housing crisis, this for-profit model that comes at the expense of people's well-being. Um, thank you all for listening in on that. Thank you, Anthony, for um, such amazing information and you know, I learned so much in just a short amount of time. Um, we'd like to invite our other panelists to join us. Um, I'll ask um, Professor Dean Caivano if he would like to go next. Sure. 
First of all, I want to thank everyone for their attendance today and the invitation to join this conversation. This is an issue that is of critical importance, particularly for our communities across the Central Valley. And I secondly want to say thank you to Anthony for the wonderfully rich and very detailed presentation. And I think perhaps the, the thing that left me so taken back is the very rigorous philosophical and historical context that you provide here. And that's something that we have to confront when we're talking about housing justice. Unlike other political issues, the question of fairness or justice when it comes to housing proceeds along many terrains and many domains. It's not only an economic issue. It's not only a political issue. It's not only an ideological, a historical, a cultural, and a symbolic issue. It's woven into the very founding and the very identity of the American Republic. And Anthony touched upon this a bit in, in his presentation, which I think was so insightful. But we need to keep in mind that the founding of the United States Republic is predicated upon two great acts of thievery. The first is the theft of bodies. And here we're talking about African bodies and bodies throughout the West Indies to use within an economic system. The second great act is the theft of land from indigenous populations. And it's these two acts that run concurrently and are fused together with a design. And that design being the governmental design of the American Republic that has created for not only nearly 250 years, but from 1619 onwards, a continent of exclusion, a continent of domination, and a continent of control. Now, I think what we can see very importantly, and Anthony talks about this and Faith in the Valley and many of the organi organizations throughout the Central Valley are shining awareness on, is that this does not just mean that we need to engage politically. We need to talk about the legacy of housing. We need to talk about the legacy of ideology and how there are competing strains of ideology in regards to the formation of the American government and how we come to understand our place in a larger context and in a society. And the first thing that we need to grapple with very importantly is how we are reliant so strongly upon the hegemony of private property. We live in a nation that has mythologized and fetishized the importance of private property, even at the expense of leaving hundreds of thousands of individuals sleeping on the streets even at the expense of asking individuals to spend upwards of 50% of their wages on housing. We are very much facing an ethical and a humanitarian crisis when it comes to housing justice. And the solution here means not just lobbying Democrats or perhaps Republicans. It means rethinking what it means to be a part of a community, what it means to no longer exploit and forget and miscount so many of our individuals who are being denied the basic right of having a safe, clean, and secure dwelling. So Anthony, first and foremost, thank you again for your wonderful comments. And I look forward to talking more and hearing other people's reactions and, and thoughts throughout the afternoon. Uh, we will transition to our next speaker today, uh, Dr. Jose. Um, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I, 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 I have to follow on what Anthony mentioned. That was a really good um, presentation. And what I was going to, 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 to few of the things I was going to say here, and Dean also talk about this. Um, so, and, and I will, I'm, I'm going to add one more thing here um, and summarizing, right? There are key components here, the take over the land, right? The take over the bodies, the subjections of body and, and get the, uh, the fruit of the labor of other people. But also it is important to me that there is a legal framework and that will be the third component. And when we take a look of, of legalities, right? Of law, the law applied either, the, the law may apply to a place or to a people. Right, like I cannot walk in the town after eight day after dusk, right? Or or I cannot um, uh, do uh, fishing here, right? So the law it applies to place and people. 
And we know this. We have been uh, um, uh, the, the legacy of these countries, the take over the land, the indigenous land, and the take over the bodies. And, and we use a legal framework to make it legal. Right. And and Anthony talked about this, about the Indian Removal Act of Andrew Jackson. Right. Uh, they we, the, the US need to expand and we start to push out, you know, indigenous. We stole the land. Right. The, the Western European colonial settlers push indigenous outside of the boundary and doing this. There there is a, a, a message here. You're not going to join the economy. They are being moved to the periphery, and everybody, uh, non-colored people, <laughs> people of color. I'm, I'm going to say non-colored people um, uh, have been, you know, dominated on this. Right? The people of color have been excluded of joining the economy. I mean, we can see this because you know we have these exclusion acts. You know, uh, people. Human beings were prohibited to own property, right? And then we pass to you know redlining, and we pass to racial restrictive covenants, and now with zoning. And and I would like I want to show you because something that happened that we start to see happening with the suburb is that segregation start to kind of change, right? And from the cities that were segregated, what we are going to see is that uh, now we have, you know, in a way, homogenous cities, right? With segregation is, you know, two different cities, let's say Akron, Ohio, and Cuyahoga Falls, right? And, and we can measure this, we can measure that what white flight, right, going to Cuyahoga Falls, because in that way, they were then the majority of the city and they were able to create you know the the laws that they want to pass if i can i would like to share um something i have here uh, can you see um uh, this template let me let me um uh, let me stop here let me share specifically this part here I think that this is this is better now. And you know, if 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 I move to a city in which I can do my own um, laws, then you know I can give shape to the city. And maybe you know, um, I want to show you here um, areas. This is the Journal of General Plan of 2012. Right. And and today what happened is that, oh, you know, I'm not segregating. Well, you are segregated. Race and socioeconomics are linked. And maybe you, you, people are not doing this on purpose, but these are unintended consequences. And what I want you to pay attention is this yellow line here is the zip code. South of that is three, uh, if 95, 380. North of that is 95, 382. And we can see a pattern. This is the general plan for 2012. And there are areas that were zoned in 2012 to be either high density residential or to be medium density residential, right? And what happened is that if you drive through those areas, you will see that things have changed. For instance, this is a church now. This is commerce. And this is two years ago, uh, you know, people, uh, the, the city changed and said, well, you know, we have an uh, office, we are going to rezone this as, zone, as, as office because, you know, uh, developer, developers cannot make money or because, uh, you know, this will bring revenues, right? And we will see how, you know, the 95382, that zip code is being segregated based on income. Because if I'm in other area, right? And I don't have half million to buy a house, but I have a quarter million to buy a condo, right? Then then maybe, maybe I'm looking to this area because my perception is, and here is what we talk about public goods, right? If there is a perception that Pittman High School, for example, is better, or the schools, I don't know uh, what school we have here, uh, um, you know, Walnut or, you know, uh, other school, uh, Air, um, uh, 
or Medeiros, is that my perception that these schools are better? I said, okay, I'm going to move to a condo to provide that opportunity to my children because this is a public good, a public good that is being enjoyed by, you know, uh, uh, just one part of the community. But I cannot move there. I cannot move there because my options of, of cheaper housing has been limited. And this is what has been happening. You know, uh, zones that have been um, uh, codified to be high density that, that can give me cheap housing, uh, uh, you know, an, another alternative for housing option. Now I cannot access to those public goods. Now, yes, if you see this area here, that's the one that have been approved and that is 95380, right? And this is close to Donnelly Park, right? There are other things, you know, for instance, when we take a look of um, what um, Dean was talking about, this individuality of, of the property, that is a different discourse when we said, oh, you know, but this is for the city's benefit. And for instance, a yeah, cannabis store, right? Uh, that's okay, you know, cannabis store and will be located where? Close to the poorest area, right? And, and well, you know, this is for the public good, you know, this is going to bring revenue. That is the discourse. And who is going to receive, what neighborhood is going to receive the cannabis uh, store? Well, will be the poorest neighborhood. Here, what I want to show you also is that these green areas are industrial areas. Where is the, uh, the poorest neighborhood in Turla? Sandwiched between the industrial areas. And this is done through public policy from the city that um, maybe was not intended for that, but the unintended consequence is desegregation uh, on income. And we know that income and race correlate here. And who has those opportunities? Other question that we ask when we take a look, uh, look to a city like this is how the city grew up, how the city expand, how the city developed, and at the cost of what group? And we can have an idea, right? Um, so those are things that I just want to share with you because we have a general plan that obviously we start to change. We have a general plan, sounds good in paper, but with time, people work in one, two jobs, single parents, I cannot go to, you know, to the uh, meetings that the city is doing, and I lost track of this plan. And now I have less options of, of housing. Um, and this is how it's done, you know, is through that legal framework. And who is, um, working on those legal framework, you know, when when uh, cities take advantage, when they have majority, they can do whatever they want. I'm not maybe this is what happened in True Look. I don't know. You have to take a look. But um, um, there is a, a colleague that I would like to 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 meet. She is um, in. Um, uh, UC Merced, and she's from political science, actually, Jessica Traunstein, if, if, if I'm pronouncing her last name correctly, she wrote a book, Segregation by Design, and in fact, is this what she's talking about? And, and those of you that were, you know, on, um, um, in a previous um, workshop about uh, redlining, and I see Sharon Froba around, uh, that book of the color of law and that other book of segregation by design go hand to hand because you can see how is as Anthony and Dean mentioned is about taking over the land, subjection of the bodies, but also there is a legal framework that permit this to happen. Uh, and of course, slavery uh, was the law, right? And we know that laws are not moral and laws might be incorrect. And this is something that has to be addressed. The question is, you know, and this is a question for the, you know, how we can organize to, to try to, you know, bring opportunities for, you know, both zip codes of the city, for example, right? That's the question that I'm posing here. Um, and thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I appreciate that. Sorry, I was over here trying to find my mic. <laughs> 
Well, um, I guess that will transition into um, some questions for our panelist speakers today. Um, I'm gonna start off the with the first question. Um, any one of you guys can go ahead and chime in on a response to this. So um, first question I have for you guys is, so we've discussed, uh, as Anthony really highlighted, a lot of the educational part to it. Um, what are some solutions to America's housing issues that center around effectively making a positive difference for true positive equitable outcomes to restore and equity gaps that have been ongoing for so long in this country? And uh, any one of you guys can go ahead, and chime in on that one. If if I may may add to that, there was a recent um, news in Manhattan Beach in Southern California, in which there was. Um, um a black family we were talking at the beginning of 1900s i think that bought uh land and the um uh, i don't really hear uh, let me see if i remember um and and was taken by eminent no domain right uh, but before that they were subject to you know the classic kkk movement of bombing their house so on and so forth but now you know there are talks that they are want to give back that piece of land to uh the family or you know something you know uh, uh some sort of money or something like that so those are the things that i'm looking that that is putting putting the actions on the word Right, because people might say, oh, you know, yes, we are uh, in inclusive, but but what are you doing that is inclusive beyond the words? The words are nice, but what are the actions? I think that that is a concrete step that can set some sort of precedent uh, for the future, because if we take a look, you know, um, those that have the advantage to, to, to accumulate wealth, right, uh, are better off now. Um, and, and talking about accumulation of wealth, you can go and, and, and look at David Harvey. He's a British geographer that talk about accumulation by disposition, which is basically what we have been talking about here, right? Um, and that is, it, it is important. So I think that one way to address that is to, to try to force um, this type of action on, you know, uh, put actions on, on your words. You know, you have to, to do something concrete that can help me, right? I think that that might be one first step. I just want to follow up on Jose's, not only the presentation of the map, I think, which is so useful and really shows the importance of human geography and the value in a social context as a social justice lens to really take on some of these issues. But in addition to Jose's comment about capital accumulation and how we can combine these, is that by looking at where capital is concentrated and how it's often reified in very small pockets, and those pockets are the closest to social services or civic goods, such as museums, theaters, public parks, et cetera, what we can see quite clearly is that almost unlike any other domain, we can see the close association between state power and capital and how state power serves to protect and insulate particular interests, corporate interests or those individuals with high accumulation of wealth. And perhaps in no other area in the American landscape, minus perhaps healthcare, which has been so hyper privatized and so protected by the American state to ensure a marketplace of consumers, we can see by looking at maps of urban spaces in cities across America, how the state functions to uphold and to protect these inequities. The state is not a force that serves to equalize the playing field or is a force of egalitarian good. These policies, and you know, Anthony mentioned Indian, Indian removal policy all the way back from 1830. Well, if we return to James Baldwin in the 1950s and the 1960s, he coined the phrase Negro removal. And that's what we saw in the revitalization of cities in, uh, in the 1950s and 60s across America, literally moving African-American communities out of the way for public goods, new sports arenas, new theaters. And this is the benefit. And this is where politics, law, geography all intersects. And we can see that to mount a 
vibrant and important resistance, we need not to simply accept that there are elected representatives who are going to do the good work. To achieve fair and equitable housing solutions, it requires organization and it requires everyday individuals to come to the table and to become stakeholders because housing is a reflection of our community. When we have people living on the streets, when we have people living in unsanitary and dilapidated buildings, that's a reflection of the health of our community. Whether you're in that segregated, highly populated, highly concentrated capital-wise section of North Turlock or North Merced, it shows and it speaks volumes of how we are functioning as a community. So a solution is that there's not just one solution. We need to develop an entire network and an entire strategies of new ideas, new approaches, all that challenge the idea that, that housing is a consumer good, that, that you have to purchase it, that it is a reflection of your social status rather than a reflection of who you are as an individual and as a member of a political and moral community. Now, a couple possible solutions are rethinking ownership, and that is cooperatives. I previously lived in a, an apartment co-op in which individuals of the apartment itself all individually yet collectively owned the property, and they all had a stake in the well-being, the maintenance, and the vitality of the building itself. Another really important strategy and solution that we're seeing, whether it's in Sacramento or here in Merced, is the idea of inclusionary zoning. Making sure that city planners, city councils, new developers are ensuring that new constructions are giving spaces for affordable housing. And really, any of this, the possibility of rethinking the paradigm of housing rests entirely on the shoulders of the people. Because as we've already seen, the government and private interests aren't going to do this. There's not an incentive to equalize property holdings. This needs to occur and will only occur through the resistance and through the organization of ordinary folks to get up and to organize and make a difference, whether it's in the church setting, in a local nonprofit setting, on your college campus, in your own neighborhood. We all have a stake in this, and it starts with us forming into associations and into groups. Wow, thank you for that. <laughs> really, um, that was a great response. Um, I don't know if anybody else really wanted to chime in on a, a responding from our panelists on that follow-up afterwards. Okay, I guess then we'll go ahead. Um, um, I'm sorry, let me look at the agenda real quick. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Is there a question in the chat? Um, yeah, I can read it. Or, go um, ahead. Someone says, uh, Mikio, I hope I pronounced it right. I know it was touched on, on a bit earlier, but I just wanted to ask if y'all could speak more to the importance of upholding the notion that, quote, the people closest to the problems are the people closest to our to solution, quote, end quote. In our organizing efforts is in trying to find community-based innovative solutions to these issues because too often community voices are unfortunately left out. Yeah, I can I can speak a little to that. Um, just based like locally here in the county, at least, um, I think there's just a lot of, you know, we mentioned this idea of like disregard as well as just you know lack of care, and I know that specifically, um, you know, we've seen it time and time again, not just in the county, but you know, um, people experiencing homelessness. Um, what's the solution of the state? And you know, it goes into what Dean was talking about. What is the state sort of um, you know, what are their, um, how do I explain this? What are their sort of like mechanisms to address these sort of issues? You know, is it the discourse around like affordable housing or the discourse of the contradictions of the economic structure, which produces, you know, people experiencing homelessness or even, you know, like you said, the de uh, degradating experiences that often comes with that. 
Um, no, it's often, you know, the opposite. It's often the um, use of police or the state or even any type of um, overt control to sort of repress and, you know, drive out these populations from, you know, our, um, our public life and even within our scope of view. I mean, a prominent example locally here is Turlock. Um, I know that they had done encampment sweeping efforts as of recently. And that was something that, you know, did that come at the sort of, um, sort of the discourse and the um, sort of, uh, you know, touching in with the people who were a part of this encampment or were who were experiencing homelessness, or did it just come at the state's sort of decision or the police's decision or even the city government's decision to drive people out of these sort of areas? So I think within all of that, um, we can discuss and sort of like point to this idea of, you know, what does it mean to really include the people who are closest to the pain? And what I think that could mean is, you know, having conversations and, you know, we hear these things about like, oh, regional task force on addressing homelessness or regional task force on addressing the housing crisis, but it often comes from a top down sort of space. You know, there are people who maybe be in academia or people in city government or urban planners or, you know, people who are farthest away from the pain and have time to philosophize and sort of debate what it means to provide affordable housing or how to deal with um, people experiencing homelessness, but it's never sort of a, uh, a touching of base with the people who are closest to those issues. So I think that, you know, for a future of, you know, community cooperation and engagement and sort of, you know, this idea of addressing the elephant in the room, our capitalist system, you know, the people who are impacted by that system and that structure have to be consulted with, you know, how can you make decisions for people to sweep them out in an encampment or to arrest them or to, you know, um, push them south? You know, that's not going to solve the issue of people experiencing homelessness because those sort of those sort of conditions reproduce in our economic system. You know, you, no matter how much money you throw at, you know, shelters or, you know, you can't arrest away the problem. You can't shelter away the problem and you can't sweep the, this issue away. You have to address the elephant in the room. And that is our, you know, capitalist system. Um, so that's my sort of idea of, you know, really reaching out to folks and sort of talking to individuals. You know, on a personal sort of level, I've spoken with various people in the community who are experiencing homelessness and are housing insecurity. And one of the things that they prominently have told me is that it's not a rewarding experience to be a person experiencing homelessness in, in any city or in any area of the community. You know, it's not, um, there's a huge stigma and, a, and like a, a sort of perspective of myself, they say, that I'm not a human being and I don't deserve to, you know, to live or even to um, be safe. So, you know, this is a perspective that they, that people have constantly and consistently spoken of when it comes to, you know, the housing issue or whether it be, you know, sleeping in the park, you know, so I think that, you know, just something as simple as that, you know, having a human to human conversation with folks and seeing how their voice as well as their perspectives are valuable in this process of an alternative to this sort of economic system. And I think that that's something that is very often overlooked and never really addressed to begin with when it comes to drafting up ideas of addressing issues such as homelessness or the housing crisis. So. Thank you for that, Anthony. <laughs> Anthony, I agree uh, with you. Anthony, you yes, I agree. I'm sorry. Go ahead, add to that. Well, Trisha, well said. You... I'm just going to chime in real quick. If you don't talk, I'm sorry. Did my mic on? If you don't, if we don't talk to the people who are um, experiencing this, I don't have that experience of homelessness. So, how can I graft a solution to what is really this, the root of what got you there? We can build wonderful homes and, and housing, which is definitely needed. But if you can't get in it and maintain it, then, you know, where are we? So, you know, we have to get out of the comfort zone and talk to the people who are closest to the pain, who have the real, um, you know, they do have a solution, even if they don't know they have the solution, because I have to understand why are you homeless? what has gotten you here. Um, if you are given housing, do you have the tools you need to sustain the housing? Um, the understanding of taking care of a home, um, you know, even though you're homeless, you don't have everything 
we need to know, is it mental health? I need to get you so you can have, um, uh, you can be sustainable in your home. So those are the things and those voices have to, um, we have to build a relationship and trust so that when we are going to our top uh, line, they hear their voices and understand what's going on so that we can form solutions for them and not just throw things at them because at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, they are our neighbors. Whether I want them to be in the park next to my house or not, they're still my neighbors because that's where they are living and I need to go you know, like I would go to my neighbor next door and sit down and have a cup of coffee. I have to go do the same thing out in the elements and meet them where they're at so that I can understand how to develop a solution. So those voices are going to be important to get them to the table. Yes, I definitely agree with you. I am actually a person that lived it and experienced it, you know, being homeless and, you know, my situation you know, a little bit about it is, um, you know, basically I never knew this eviction was on my record. So I went out on my own and try to get my own, pretty much my own place, you know, with my kids next, you know, Hey, there's an eviction. And I never knew this. And this been on there, on there since 2016 or 15 around there. So ever since it's been haunting me till this day now, it's still on there. So it's just, you know, hearing from people and actually, you know, I'm thankful and grateful that I was able to um, reach out and, you know, communicate myself with um, Janine from Faith in the Valley. And basically if you're here in Fresno, you got to know someone and know someone that can help you. You know, my situation, like I mentioned, the eviction is on my record. And to this day, like I have proof, I take it to court. Hey, it shouldn't be on there. Okay. You know, I have proof from the landlord, a letter stating that, Hey, everything's paid off. Nothing was done inside court. It was outside of court and they still haven't taken it out. So it's just like, what do I do now? You know, the basically now the the landlord is the one that has that power to go out there and remove it if he chooses to. But I call them and he still refuses. So you know, it's pretty much good to you know hear the people's voice and see where they're coming from. And basically, that's just a little bit that I want to say. Thank you guys. There's some questions in the chat box. So uh, any of you panelists can go ahead and answer any one of those questions. And thank you for your response, by the way, uh, that added commentary. I was gonna say, thank you for sharing Jessica, by the way. I just wanna piggyback off of Latricia's really important reflection. And the word that stuck out to me so prominently was in their use of the word trust. And Community organizing requires trust and building alliances require trust between individuals and between organizations. And that's key to any successful organization and any successful organizing and activism. But the issue of trust also is far more reaching when we're talking about the American system here, because we live in a political system that fundamentally is designed around the idea that we cannot trust the people that it is the people who are a threat to order and stability, that it is the people who are uneducated and untrained and who do not know what is in their best interest. Now, when we look at that in the context and in the lens of housing, we can see that housing is none other than the perfect reflection of discriminatory practices and control. And what we need to start doing is is trying to escape and remove the myth that has been so firmly ingrained into the mythology and the psychology of the American psyche. And that's the idea that home ownership is a reflection of prosperity. And that home ownership is a physical marker of your success, of your rationality, of your bank account, of the numbers that you have in your ATM. And the consequence, and I think this connects very importantly to the way that we view the homeless individual, it's in an analogous way as to how the black body or the indigenous body was viewed throughout the history of the American Republic. A homeless individual 
is imprinted with a mark of criminality because they signal to society that they have failed, that they didn't complete their education, that they couldn't hold a job, that they couldn't afford their mortgage or their rent. So they are the perfect reflection. And here we see the crystallization of the priority of responsibility, personal responsibility. And all you merely have to do is to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, we need to tear that stigma away. We need to stop criminalizing and demonizing and incarcerating individuals who are on our streets, who have no resources afforded to them. And the way that we can start doing that is trust. Trust that people know what's in their best interest. Trust that people are capable of holding the levers of power. Trust that collective decision rather than technocratic decisions are the way that we can bring about a more just, a more fair, and a more equitable society, particularly here in California, where the housing crisis is beyond the point of the Rubicon, where we have crossed that point. We are facing, again, a humanitarian and ethical crisis here in California, and we need to start trusting that individuals who are living outside of Silicon Valley or outside of the Bay or outside of LA have in value and have meaning and have importance and have things to contribute to how their communities ought to be organized. I would like to add that um, try to, I mean, and I don't know other way, I mean, besides organizing, but organize to run, right? Organize to run as a council person on the city because, I mean, looking to true luck, I mean, I can draw some conclusions here of what had been happening. You know, uh, yes, uh, we have to take into consideration people that have experienced homelessness. Um, and we said, oh, we have to listen to them, which we do, but you know, the city at the end of the day is the one that is making decision and just for a pure democratic process, you know, just to, to pretend that we listen everybody equally, we just listen uh, people, but at the end of the day, those are the people taking the decisions and that's how our system works. So my question then, uh, not my question, but my suggestion is then we have to organize them to run. And, and the base is the one that should be doing this. You know, people that really represent the majority of the people, right? Um, because I don't know, maybe I can be uh, um, uh, a developer, right? And I go to the city and I have, I have my interest. And because I have those, interest, you know, I'm, I'm going to shape the city in the way that is convenient for me, but that is not representative for all the people that are here. And then my suggestion is, yes, um, organize to run and win. I, I don't see other way to, to do it. Uh, geography can be useful, uh, by the way, right? But we have to, to start from some place, but it is it, 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 it is the people that is on the base, not not the the people that you know that are more comfortable. Is the people that represent the majority, uh, and that should I mean that should be for sure, um, you know what we what we need. I mean, take a look of the Congress. I mean that's that doesn't represent me. You know, the majority of the people have uh, like the double of my age, I think, uh, at least half or half. Uh, I don't know, they are billionaires, I don't know, but th those people do not represent me, the majority of them. So something is wrong, it's not working. So organize to run and win. Um, I think that that is the other part we have to put there um, because, you know, looking to the city, you know, um, that's, to me, is, is not, not, doesn't make it for me, right? And I'm sure that many of you are in the same situation. So I think that that will be the, the other part. Um, and, you know, all these people that are here, 
it's a good start. You know, you reach them and 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 you know, some person start to think what what is the next step we have to do and and we can start to to work piece by piece. But that 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 I think that that's the only, I mean, I know other ways, but are not the, the best one by this point. But 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 you know, I think that that is organizing to run and win is is a really good way to to start. And and you know that everybody that are here is 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 a potential person that that might contribute in something. Thank you for that. Um... I would like to address one of the questions that was in the chat um, from David. I'm sorry if I butcher your last name, Froba. <laughs> um, what are specific practical ways locally to increase low income housing zoning, maybe? For any of the panelists, go ahead. Two really practical and ongoing strategies that we can use to try to accomplish a more equitable distribution of affordable housing. One is the idea of inclusionary zoning. And this is where local communities and local organizations apply direct pressure to city council and to city managers to mandate through law that any new constructions, any new builds, any new subdivisions, anything along those lines, specify and make sure that there is a percentage of those dwellings and those units that are affordable housing. Now, these are ongoing efforts and we see this across California and this is this is great gaining traction. So that's one issue that's really, really important. The other one is the issue of single family dwelling. And we're seeing this take place up in Sacramento where by the end of this year, they are going to outlaw single family dwelling because single family dwelling very importantly prohibits uh, more inclusive and more affordable housing from taking place. And as we saw in that map that Jose presented, it starts to segregate and push certain populations and certain populations mean low income individuals, racialized ethnic populations away from the center or from more uh, services. So lobbying local uh, governments about ending single family dwelling, lobbying local officials about inclusionary zoning are two really practical and really vibrant strategies I'll throw one more in there since I've already unmuted and finding the mute button is always gonna be difficult. The other one is the idea of participatory budgeting. And that is where individuals lobby to local governments about a portion of funds, an allocation of the city budget. And instead of city council, instead of city managers, instead of uh, developers deciding how to spend money, guess who gets to decide how money will be spent in the local neighborhoods? us, the people. We can see this across the United States and across the world of really successful examples of participatory budgeting where local community members come together and figure out how to spend money on new housing projects, new transportation projects, new educational projects. Here we can see that power is only real when it's collective, when we decide how we're going to construct and how we're going to build a society in which we live in. These things require energy, lobbying, organizing, time, energy, sacrifices, but it's worth it because we're making our communities safer, cleaner, more equitable, more safe. I mean, the future is ours to determine. If we continue to let technocrats and elected representatives do as they see fit, well, they're going to continue policies of exclusion, policies of domination, and politics of control. I want to add, this is important why you have to run. Because for instance, if you have a city in which you have majority of council, right? And they have a plan already, and they said, we are, you know, local pressure, yeah, can be, but we'll be on the discussion on the agenda. Well, that agenda in some cities, right? In some cities has to be approved and the majority approve the agenda. So, you know, I have, I, I might be uh, coming from a, a low income neighborhood that want to do some changes, but the other members of the council um, of the city, they, they are not going to approve that. And people can go and make comment, but if it's not in the agenda, it's not going to happen anything. No, it's not going to happen. This is why you 
have to run. You have to organize and win to put those things in a, in agenda because you know that is really is and and what's what Dean said is is really true. This is a twenty four seven. This is another job, and this is why it's harder for us people that have you know two jobs or we are single parents or whatever coming from public housing or food stamps, right? This is why for us it's harder, right? And this is this is why organizing is another extra job. But is it possible? And if if you organize to win, then you can make these changes, and you can then decide how you want to uh, arrange the city. I I can't stress Jose's points enough. How important it is to organize to win, not just symbolically or not just to toss your hat into the ring, but to win. But the thing that I think is ever so important is that it's not just one of us here in this group of 25. It's all of us because we need, beyond, we need to think beyond the two party and we need to think of candidates beyond just the Democrats and the Republicans. We need alliances of migrant workers, of homeless individuals, of students, of individuals who are back in school, of students who are retired. We need intersectional alliances that bring together the diverse background of our community. And to do so requires all of us, not just the exceptional candidate who pretends that they can make Merced great again or America great again, but it requires all of us to work, to pick up the phone, to text bank, to donate, to organize, to protest, to think beyond the two party system. I totally agree because, you know, all of us, we can definitely make a change. And it's just, you know, each and one of us, we have different talents, different perspectives. And, you know, we all have the collective ideas together as a team. And we can definitely, you know, make this happen, make it, you know, change. Let's make a change. And I encourage you guys to definitely join us and let's make this change for the best, for the better. Thank you. Jessica, you rock indeed. Thank you for that. Um, I believe, is that a hand raised by May Curry? If, if so, go ahead, speak. Yeah. So my name is May. I currently live over in Santa Clara County right now. I know over here in Santa Clara County, there's a nonprofit that actually has tiny homes and helps the homeless transition to permanent housing. I was just wondering if there's any push over in Central Valley for something like that, like Santa Clara has, because they have a thing called Home First. And I know a few people who work there and they've explained to me that like this transition, they um, help transition the homeless to permanent housing. They give resources like workshops. And I know that um, people who live there, they have workshops to resumes, job hunting and all that part. Is there anything like that over in the Central Valley? I you excuse me, me. Oh, you speak. Somebody, who was that? Go ahead, speak. Hello, can you speak? Hi, Miguel. Uh, <laughs> would you like to speak? Yeah, My question? name is Miguel Donoso. I'm from Stanislaus County, Modesto. Yes, please. I, I want to know if you guys discussed already the, the housing element. Yes, we did speak on a lot of the housing elements already, um, but can we uh, go ahead and allow um, the Trisha to go ahead and answer the question that was asked? Um, if you no, could, I, I want to hear from Miguel. Are you? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Miguel. What, what, are, you, what are you asking, Miguel? The issue is the, the, the housing element is a mandate by the state of California, and yet the majority of housing element cities in county are behind two or three years to report the actual uh, the regional housing allocation, uh, especially for the farm workers, uh, the low-income families and large families and uh, homeless. I think one of the key is that we missing is more enforcement or uh, an agency like, like CRLA uh, to enforce and, and make some kind of suit against the city or the county 
they are failing to do the housing element in the sense of not to blame all the time the industry of housing developers and whatever, because many cities don't want to have the inclusionary zoning or don't want to change the zoning to accommodate more low income houses in a specific area. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. May, um, I have seen talks uh, behind the scenes about the tiny homes. I think they're looking into that um, program. And um, I think that's where we are on that. There is nothing written that I have seen um, in any spaces that I've been, doesn't mean that it isn't moving further along to bring that kind of concept here. Um, we'll have to follow up with um, the housing committee with the city. Uh, and specifically, I'm talking Modesto. Uh, County-wise, I haven't talked to the Board of Supervisors yet regarding that, but that is on my agenda. Um, and, sure, oops, sorry. Wanna make sure I understood your um, statement or your question about the housing issues in our county. Is that right? Yes, I'm talking about. The, yes, I'm talking about the whole Stanislaus County. Mm -hmm. uh, it's supposed to uh, the state is supposed to do something when you receive some kind of money from the state of federal grants. Uh, the you supposed to uh, make comment or do some kind of report how the conditions of the housing element and what you're doing or your goal and objectives to improve, how is you going to make more houses, especially for low income seniors, uh, farm workers in, in, in all the area that are missing because the the one, the biggest problem, the second problem is the land element. Uh, many cities don't have enough uh, allocation in his zoning to do a better job to allocate more houses for the low income and minorities and poor people in the community, especially when this every year, the land is going to cost, cost more and more. So many, Nonprofit agency they do housing like self help and different agency cannot afford even to buy the 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 property because it's too expensive. Thank you. To that, that was uh, yeah, I covered. Um, I I think we have that probably have real. Left. <laughs> that was very real. <laughs> um, I think we have time for like one more question. Um, Did anyone on the panel want to address Miguel first? I'm sorry, have, Isaac. No, you're fine. Did anybody want to address exactly I, what Miguel? I just want to say, Miguel, first of all, thank you for sharing those comments and your reflection is really, really important. And a lot of that has to do with legislation that we saw that was passed in the 1960s, largely from the Fair Housing Act of 1968 that requires a more equitable allocation of affordable housing. But what you bring up is ever so important that even though there are federal regulations in place and cities and states have to comply to make sure that there are an availability of affordable housing, it does not translate into reality. It does not always mean that there will be enforcement of federal policies or even state policies. And how often, because particularly as we see here in California, the skyrocketing prices of property, it actually prices out affordable housing from actually getting built or from dwellings from actually materializing. Here again, I think your comments are just further supplement and further enhancing the calls for organizing. Because if we think the state of California or the government in the Stanislaus County or Merced County or Fresno, whomever is simply going to do this because there's a law on the book, well, unfortunately, we're going to be waiting for a very, very long time for that to happen. So I want to thank you for your comments. And I think, if anything, they point to the sense of urgency around this issue and how important it is for us to organize and mobilize and agitate. Indeed. 
Miguel, did you see in the chat that um, uh, Anthony put information for you to contact him so we can further discuss this with you? No. Are, are you, do you have access? Yes, to please. See the chat? Yeah, I see it right now. Okay, so if you jot down his information and reach out to him, he'll set up an appointment uh, with you to further discuss this. That be okay? Wanna... Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, Thank what did you, you say, Jessica? Yeah, I want to say one more thing. So we do meet like on Fridays. If you guys are interested in the RTC program as well, um, you guys can definitely, you know, um, with, with Faith in the Valley, if you guys are definitely interested with the RTC, you guys can join us as well. It's um, from three to five and, you know, want us to hear your voice and just ex what you guys are experiencing. You guys are definitely welcome to join us. RTC, right to counsel. Yes, correct. <laughs> right to counsel. Yes. And, you know, I encourage you guys to definitely, you know, let's make that change. And, you know, from here on on now, you know, let's, you know, we want the best for our kids, our future, for their, their future. And like I mentioned, you know, it's just a lot of people, you know, it's one of many that go through a lot. And right now we need it. We need this help. I encourage you guys to definitely join us and make that change. You know, a little bit of help that you can give. You have a little bit of power, that little bit of time that you guys can give us. We definitely, um, you know, thank you guys for that. And let's make that change. Thank you, guys. And you, Jessica, put the information in the chat for the uh, Friday uh, right to council meeting? Yes, I'll go ahead and do that right now. All right, thanks, son. Thank I'm you for sorry, that, I Jessica. No, you're good. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jessica, uh, for providing the information for everybody else. Check the chat box if you're not checking out the chat box. And um, so you guys could, if you guys want to be involved, which leads us to the last question for today uh, for our panelists is how do we, how do we, the people, get involved? How do we, the people, get involved? Ah, uh, music. Yes, I have the answer for that. <laughs> um, you can contact us um, at Faith in the Valley, well, at um, Latricia at Faith in the Valley uh, here in Stanislaw County. Also, um, I'm gonna, um, do we have the link for our listening session on April 22nd? Yeah, I was gonna mention, it's like, it's like a first thing. So it's sort of like a follow-up on how to get involved. And we can, you know, we can discuss those ideas as well as you know, um, action steps that we could have in our community around housing in the listening session, in the chat. Um, Godalina actually dropped it. And it's for, like I mentioned earlier, um, this next week on the 22nd at 6 p.m. And there's an official flyer there with a Zoom link included. That way you can, you know, have that for, you know, your access if you'd like to join in and are able to join in on that space, so. Thank you for that, by the way. Um, did anybody else want to respond from any of the other panelists? By chance? I'll be quick. There's a grand narrative that likes to circulate around American political discourse. And that is that we, the people, are apathetic. That we, the people, don't really care at the end of the day. We want to be left alone. We want to watch our Netflix or go to work. And we'll let the representatives in DC or Sacramento do the heavy lifting. I don't think it's the case at all. I think often people don't engage in politics because we feel powerless. We feel like we can't actually make a difference. And when we're talking about bringing affordable housing, ending the homelessness crisis, bringing about a more equitable and more just-based society, well, that seems like a very high hill to climb. But what it requires is for us to believe that another world is possible, a different type of society is possible. And it requires us to sometimes join local affiliations, join places like Faith in the Valley or wherever you may find yourself. And we are very fortunate for all the perhaps contradictions that come to heed in the Central Valley. This is also a very rich and vibrant place for organizing. And there are many very, very important organizations and nonprofits that are doing the good work and fighting the good fight. Link up with one of them. 
Link up with your local churches, with your local organizations, link up with your friends, with your neighbors who are probably feeling and thinking the same way. Call, email your city council person, call, email your mayor. Don't get discouraged after one non-respondent email or one e voicemail that didn't get answered. It's gonna take a million of them, but they're all be worth it. And so I would encourage you and I, I'm gonna drop my email address in the chat as well as my cell phone number. If anyone is in the Merced area, I live in the city of Merced and is looking for organizations to join or wants to just talk about how to become political act, politically active, shoot me a message. Happy to speak with you and hopefully build something beautiful with all of you. Thank you for that. Um, I guess then we'll kind of start wrapping it up a little bit, unless anybody else wanted to add to that as well. All right, uh, for our closing remarks, um, um, for our closing remarks today is uh, that we hope that what you uh, take away from all this is a newfound learning from our speakers today. Housing has always been an issue in this country, as I'm sure you have been able to see for yourself from the freeway exits to your downtowns and maybe from your own experiences dealing with housing in this country. Affordable and equitable housing is a basic human right in society that um, in, a, in a society that is the wealthiest of all other societies is ridiculous to me. It's, it's just outrageous. <laughs> but uh, on that note, um, I would like to thank Faith in the Valley, um, Housing and Residential Life, MSI, the Warrior Cross Culture Center, Professor Jose, uh, Professor uh, Dean uh, for co-sponsoring today's event. Um, th honestly, this event would have been as successful or um, as eventful as without you guys speaking today. I can't thank you guys enough for volunteering your time and we appreciate what you guys um, were doing today, just educating everybody in the audience today. I don't know if anybody else wanted to leave any closing remarks from this. Um, <laughs> Just on behalf of the Warrior Cross Cultural Center, thank you to our panelists. Um, thank you, Professor Dean Caivano. Uh, thank you, Professor Jose Diaz Garayua. Um, thank you, Latricia and Anthony from Faith in the Valley. We appreciate all of the wonderful educational information we received today. It is critical, it is important, and it's time to get involved. So we're looking forward to learning about some ways that we can take actionable steps and really try to encourage even our own students to think about, you know, ways that they can start now preparing on how to, you know, be more involved in and really make a difference in their communities. Um, we also want to just take a quick moment to invite you all to our next event, which is happening tomorrow. It's called A Workplace Divided. It's really addressing um, some critical issues surrounding the algae BTQ population and thinking about ways that we can create a more inclusive space in the workplaces. Um, and so we invite you, there's a link in the chat where you can register and learn more about ways that uh, we can support. And so once again, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everybody. All. Thank appreciate you all. <laughs> appreciate it.